today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, we host over 150 free programs, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. To find out more about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org, or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. On behalf of our literary committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event featuring Claire Massoud, the acclaimed author of The Emperor's Children and The Woman Upstairs. Claire is a recipient of Guggenheim and Radcliffe Fellowships and the Strauss Living Award from the American Academy of Letters, uh, Arts and Letters. Her new book of personal essays, Kant's Little Prussian Hit and Other Reasons Why I Write, shows us that she herself is just as compelling as her creations. Claire will be in conversation with Liesl Schillinger, a New York-based critic, translator, and moderator. Her articles and essays have appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Vogue, Foreign Policy, and many other publications. Claire's book can be purchased at a discount from our preferred independent bookseller, Books on Call, and we'll be sharing that link in the chat during the conversation. Following the conversation will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. And without further ado, let me turn it over to Claire and Liesl. Please enjoy their conversation. Mute it. Thank you, Nadine. Hello, Liesl. How lovely to be here with you. Thank you, Nadine, for having us. It's wonderful. What a treat. It's wonderful to see you, to see you both. And, and Claire, you know, the last time we spoke was only a couple of years ago when you had just come out with a book called uh, Burning Girl, uh, which I had reviewed for Oprah. And um, that was, I think, your, your sixth book. And we talked then about how I'd actually known you and been in awe of you at college when you were a very serious uh, student uh, who just, just, just emanated literary intensity. And, uh, <laughs> and I, was, I, was, you know, I, I was abashed. And, um, and, uh, and I have read you from afar. And um, I was really happy to read this book because I don't think you've written memoir before. And, uh, you know, this book, it's, a, it's sort of a hybrid uh, because it's both memoir and it brings together, I, I can't remember how many, maybe 16 or more than a dozen uh, essays on some of the writers, photographers, painters who've influenced you. So um, I'm, I'm just interested in two things. One is, I'll start with the first. Um, why do you think you put off writing a memoir or did you put it off? Why did you choose, what, what about this moment made it feel right to tackle that in this book? That, that's a good question. I, you know, it's funny, it's, as you say, it's a hybrid book. It's, it, it, it's sort of a, it, it's a, a particular sort of memoir. I guess I think of it as a memoir of my sensibility uh, as much as, as anything else. Um, but, but the reason why, so, so many of the pieces in here had been published before as as uh, the you know, book reviews or pieces about artworks or whatever, and and some of the personal pieces also, um, and some are new. But 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 the reason why now, it, it, you know, there's actually sort of a long story behind it. But 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 the brief version would be um, that I came I came to realize that all sorts of things about um, all sorts of of, of understandings about how I live in the world, things that mattered, things that I took for granted that were sort of common um, or widespread at least principles, suddenly um, seemed in recent years called into question by the culture around us. So, I mean, that I, I mean that both in terms of um, something like um, uh, tolerance and and worldliness and the lowering of barriers. I thought we were moving towards hybridity and um, and and internationalism and um, you know a sort of welcoming openness. And then and then the past few years in this country, I mean things are maybe I hope changing now. But the past um, administration sort of was a different 
just put forward a whole different um, worldview. But I think at the same time, also, I, I, I grew up, um, you know, I, I, I was raised, I was very lucky to have readers for parents. And I was raised to believe that reading the, the reading was your companion for life and that you know you you were never alone you know there's a wonderful um umberto echo quote about how, you know the reader lives ten thousand lives or something you know and the uh, and the non-reader lives one um so so and, and i feel that that has been in jeopardy too the idea that a sort of reflective or 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 um literary life um seems less obvious to people and i suddenly thought well maybe i you know mm -hmm just should say so, that it you matters. Know, you, you begin your book, the, the book is not uh, wildly political, you know, so people shouldn't think that this is going to directly reflect the Trump administration or anything, but you do begin by talking about, you call it the breathless hurtling of the past decade. You feel that people have lost confidence in the present, uh, which makes them fear for the future, if I understand it. It, it feels like you're trying to get back to a mood of confidence in what what structures do support us does that make sense to you yes i, I think also I, I i you know i realized with i we have children who are now um you know almost 20 i was 17 and 19 and and i realized that there are just things like the the dignity of a small life right the importance of communication between between just two individuals, those things they haven't been they haven't been raised with that. I, I I grew up writing letters to all my friends, and all my friends were you know all summer long I, I'd be a temporary secretary somewhere, and I would spend my free time at my desk typing letters to my friends, and and on the one hand, well you know communications changed, it's fine, but but when you think about it, the the sort of 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 what you communicate in a letter, right, the intimacy of it, the interiority of it. The fact that it, um, have I frozen? No, you're fine. Okay, um, the interiority of it, the fact that it's directly addressed to one person, right? It's not a blog post, it's not a tweet, it's not about reaching thousands of people. It's about saying, my thoughts matter, you matter to me, Liesl. I'm gonna spend three hours writing a 10 page letter to you, Liesl, about the things that I've been thinking about, right? It's a type of intimacy. Um, you, you actually address that intimacy um, early in the book when you're talking about essays and book reviews. You say that they're kind of a replacement for the epistolary form. In a way, do you see the book reviews you write as almost you're writing it for the world, but do you feel that there was something? How do you see the personal uh, or tone in the epistolary, qual epistolary qualities of these reviews or essays you write? Well, I think so many of them are in the book. Yeah, I, I think when I, you know, so, um, it, it's a funny, I, I don't know how it's sort of evolved um, because I probably didn't start out that way when I wrote reviews first at, in my early twenties, I probably was then trying to say like, I think this is good or I think this is not good. But, but I feel that mostly my endeavor now is, 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 is to sort of read as a, in, as a listener at, almost and to try to figure out what somebody, what, what somebody is trying to convey to me Right and 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 whether I you know what I what I seem able to glean of that I feel as though the 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 there there seems to me something magical and so powerful about the about that type of communication somebody writing not just a letter but a whole book right they've spent probably years possibly a decade you know um, to 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 distill this this artifact fiction nonfiction poetry whatever it is and and they're trying to communicate something and it seems um it seems it seems an honor to uh, and and respectful to try to listen to try to pay attention to what somebody's trying to say now it, it's interesting um in the book you write well you just told us now that you grew up in a family where reading was very important both your parents were big readers but your father did not write at all. And it seems that that, that really worried you. Uh, and it also made you feel the importance of writing. You said that your father had renounced the possibility of being understood, the value of passing on his knowledge. Meanwhile, your grandfather, and your grandfather was a pied noir. He was a French Algerian. So I, you write in the book, we learned that he was eight years older than Camus and grew up in a working class neighborhood. And, uh, or maybe he grew up in the village of Blida. Is that right? Right, yeah. it was your father who grew up in Babalwed. Um, 
uh, and uh, your father actually was at, was at school with Jacques Derrida and did better than Derrida on philosophy, right? That's so clearly, okay. I never saw the report cards. I have no idea, but that's what he would say. He used to say, how did that guy get so famous? I did better than him in high school. <laughs> but but so so your father was your grandfather as i was saying wrote a 1500 page by hand record of his life experience just for you and your sister but your father wrote nothing um you know how did those factors combine do you think that that was a big impetus to your becoming a writer or how did that affect your thoughts about it well you know when i was growing up i thought I thought that I had like sort of Athena springing fully formed from the head of Zeus, that I was just born a writer because, you know, the gods had 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 dictated that I would be a writer. I decided very, I announced to the world very early, I announced to my parents when I was about six. I mean, for my sixth birthday, they gave me a, a kid's typewriter because I had already said I wanted to be a, a writer. So, you know, I, 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 my story was always, you know, that's just me. And then I, you, you grow up and you realize, well, actually, you know, your grandfather spent his retirement writing, you know, this vast tome. My, my mother, who, who was a huge reader and, 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 and inveterate letter writer, I mean, sometimes in college, she'd send me five letters a week, wonderful letters, you know, that many of which I still have. Um, and, and, and it was, you know, the books that she left in the bathroom that I, that I, you know, she, I, Virginia Woolf's diaries left in the bathroom sort of thing that I, that I started reading um, in my early teens that, that I think really shaped my sensibility. So, so the idea that, um, I, I mean, I think I was made a writer by, because I came from a family on both sides of people who, who cared hugely about that. That, I was going to ask you specifically about that. You know, the writing and your father's not writing seems to have really affected you, but reading particularly, the, the books you rated from your mother seems to have shaped your tastes. But then you, 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 you went off on your own way also. But, but I also, my mother made me a reading list from the time I was five. I read a classic novel every week and it could have been, you know, Wharton or Thor Heyerdahl, or it could be all of the classics, um, Stendhal, um, but what, but I rated from her bookshelves the same books you mentioned, or some of them, Barbara Pym, Muriel Spark, Elizabeth Bowen. Um, and you wrote this wonderful thing, which is that it never occurred to you that what you read wasn't something everyone else in the world was reading too, that, that they didn't have the same references. So I, well, how do you think it shaped your psyche, this mid-century woman's literary tastes? And oh. in, I mean, I'm sure in all, sorts of, uh, in all sorts of ways. I mean, you know, I do, I love, I love a compound complex sentence. I'm sure that's partly because of of of, of reading them. You know, I, I love a I love a, a sort of Britishly ironic, wry, uh, dark humor. I love you know Muriel a Muriel Spark like sen uh, sensibility is is delicious to me. Um, it's like a it's like a sort of crisp white wine, you know. Um, but um, so in that way, but also you know I have to say, and I think I, I think I, I mentioned this in the in the book but or maybe not but but it gave me this idea that um that I was being a writer almost the way you would become a, a nun that it was that it was it I vocation I, a vocation and one in which you were sacrificing perhaps all sort of luxury and comfort you know I had the, the many of these women had pretty not Elizabeth Bowen so much but but you know Jean Reese who who was living in Cornwall and and heard on the BBC radio uh, heard her obituary because she had so vanished from the world that they thought she was dead. Um, and she, she sort of called up and said, I'm not dead, I'm not dead. I mean, uh, well, Christina, Christina Stead, who lived out her days in a bedsit in North London, eating baked beans out of a tin. You know, I, I sort of figured that's what I was signing up for, you know. The man, who, the man Who Loved Children was one of the books my mother assigned me. I think I was nine. Uh, I, I loved that book. Uh, very disturbing. Uh, and, uh, you know, just the egotism of, of, of parenthood can represent. Um, but so when you were reading those books and being inspired by them, you know, you were, that was your entire child, that was your entire childhood, adulthood, etc. I love the sense of vocation you got. But when you got that typewriter, you were six, and you were living in Australia, in Sydney, in the grandest house you would ever live in. But uh, it was wonderful to retravel with you the the locations of your past. And it was a, your memory to me is amazing because it starts when you're four years old in Stamford, Connecticut. And I'm just wondering, did you keep a diary or are these just memories that you were able to draw on when the time came to write this book 
and maybe you could just tell the the, the listeners just about your journey, you know, uh, in terms of just geography, a little. So yeah, so so I was um, born in the United States, but my my mother was Canadian from Toronto, and my father was uh, French. He was Quinois, and and my sister had been born in France. So I I before they moved to the states. So I was the I was the only American in the family. I sponsored my parents for green cards when I turned twenty one. Up till then, they were on my father's business visa. Um, and um, we lived here um, in the States till I was four, then briefly in Toronto while they were fixing things up in Sydney. Then we were in Sydney from 71 to the end of 75, then back in Toronto, uh, 76 to September 1980. And then I went to boarding school. Um, my parents were moving to uh, the States. My dad was working in New York and they weren't sure if they would have to move again. And at that point we were at a level of school that it seemed as though it was best to park us in boarding school where we could finish. <laughs> I, I love the way you evoke your grandmother's house in in, uh, in 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 Canada in Toronto, and the the ox blood colored cement floor in the basement and the little tricycle you rode around the the floor there. My grandmother's uh, basement was exactly the same in Illinois, and you her, she had this padded bosom, but you didn't know. And her sense of fun and her name was Marjorie Riches. What a great name! That is a Barbara Pym character for you. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a wonderful moment when you talk about uh, actually Tolstoy's uh, book, Childhood, and how he brings alive people that none of us will ever know in this simple scene of a boy waking up one morning after his 10th birthday. And I think it's a family retainer, swats a fly off his nose and so forth. And you talk about the magic of creating a character, but you say that you, it's a kind of magic that you perform just when you mention your grandmother's name to your sister. Um, and I'm wondering if turning your family into characters, what kind of what how how would how did that feel for you? And what were you trying to you did you did you achieve what you were trying to achieve? I who knows, right? Who knows? I mean, I, I think it's one of the things that I that I um that I feel more and more um with time is that is that uh I, I'm thinking of that there's the Louise uh bourgeois uh, quote about where she says every stitch about embroidery every stitch is an act of repair um, but but there's there's some way in which I think that that writing is about um, bringing you know it's it's like it's like it's like taking a sieve to the ocean and and trying to sort of carry the water uh, back you know back up the beach and the water is falling through the whole time um, but what what do you what do you transmit you don't really know fail again fail better um, you know, right. but 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 on the other hand this extraordinary it's it's i know it sounds very childish but i think so often of it it just seems so strange to me that 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 everything that's in our heads dies with us so and yet if you just put it on paper you put it on paper you know i teach at harvard i when, when before the pandemic i had taken to taking my students once a semester to the houghton library and they would lay out for us you know the diary of George Eliot, and you know a James Baldwin manuscript, and uh, you know Joyce's notes on the on the galleys of of Ulysses, and Henry James's notes on on portraits. Of, you know, a, a Flaubert from letter from Flaubert to Turgenev, right? It's all there, right? It, what a, a lot that was in their heads gone, vanished. But what was put on paper, not on a computer, mind you. They just, when you go to the Houghton, they'll say to you, don't put it on a computer, put it on paper, paper lasts. I, I just, um, I, I, this, this book was so rich. I mean, I underlined almost every passage. Uh, well, I, I really did. Um, but there's a point when you said, when you started writing, you realized that in making up stories, you could create a contained world in which an experience that you shared, you could, you could, you could relay experience in its entirety. So it's immortalizing that past. And it made me think a little of Knausgaard uh, whom you mentioned briefly in the book, but you know who who discovered that our memories, every one of them, is resides in our head, and we can show their significance by bringing them out. Um, when did you first publish something, uh, publish a literary novel or essay or something like that? Because your um, first book came out, you were still very young, nineteen ninety five or six, I think. It uh, came out in the UK in ninety four, and okay. here in ninety five. 
So I was living in the UK. That was when the world was steady. Um, and I'm trying to think, I, I think an extract from when the world was steady came out in Granta magazine before that. So that was probably, I, I was working at that point at the, I, I was working at the uh, Guardian newspaper in London. So I was um, on the women's page and then as a freelancer. So I, I had published articles. I, I wrote book reviews for the TLS at the time, which is now, you know, 30, 30 years ago. Oh my goodness. Um, no, in the early, you were sick. In the early nineties. Um, I remember you were paid the same amount that uh, per review that Virginia Woolf had been paid to write for the TLS in 1925. So global heritage. Um, um, <laughs> so um, I thought maybe we would, uh, since I'm so curious to understand, you know, why you were brought to be a writer, aside from your family influences, maybe we could, you could do a little reading from the chapter, which explains why you write and explains the curious name of this book. So I, yes, sure. I'll read. This is there. This is the title essay, Kant's Little Prussian Head and Other Reasons Why I Write. And it should, strictly speaking, be Kant's Little East Prussian Head, but that seemed too many words. So I, 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 I took the liberty of cutting one, but I'll just read a brief passage that, um, that sort of uh, explains where the title comes from. Okay. Um, and, and, and it, it, I, I should, I'm referring to the author Thomas Bernhardt, who was a, 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 a crabby Austrian who lived from 1931 to 1989 um, and wrote um, uh, marvelous, funny, angry, and dark books, most of them uh, monologues and also plays. He wrote novels and plays. As Thomas Bernhardt's scathing narrator recalls in his brilliant novel, The Loser, while reflecting upon his friendship with the pianist Glenn Gould, who is, needless to say, the narrator's figment, a version of the genius that only partially resembles the man himself, but that's another story. Anyway, the narrator recalls Glenn saying, fundamentally, we are capable of everything. Equally fundamentally, we fail at everything, he said, I thought. Our great philosophers, our greatest poets, shrivel down to a single successful sentence, he said, I thought. That's the truth. Often we remember only a so-called philosophical hue, he said, I thought. We study a monumental work, for example, Kant's work, and in time it shrivels down to Kant's little East Prussian head and to a thoroughly amorphous world of night and fog, which winds up in the same state of helplessness as all the others, <laughs> he said, I thought. That's the end of the quote. A good friend of mine, a philosopher and a Kant scholar, has devoted the past 20 years to interpreting passages of Kant's critique of judgment. It is but one of the briefer texts in Kant's monumental work, and yet, in order properly and thoroughly to understand it, she has committed all of her adult life thus far and considers her labor far from complete. For almost all of us, such serious focus on Kant's thought is impossible. For most of us, if we apprehend even a so-called philosophical hue, we consider ourselves in pretty good shape. It's like the dizzying enormousness of the cosmos in reverse. If in order properly to understand a paragraph of Kant, one would need to engage in a lifetime of study, what are we to make of the entire breadth of his oeuvre, the observ observable universe of his oeuvre, if you will? And what, beyond that, are we to make of the fact that Kant's published writings represent already a careful ordering and editing and articulation into intelligible language of his philosophy, of his conscious thought? And beyond that, given that his thought arose in part from his experience, experience all but entirely lost to us, made up of countless minutes and hours and days and years of life upon this planet, of Kant's individual and particular life, how are we to conceive of the unknowable vastness that was Kant? And further, if Kant is just one philosopher among thousands, just one German among millions, just one man among billions, how can we conceive of the entirety of uncommunicated and incommunicable human experience? What infinite, infinite, invisible universe of Bernhardian night and fog is this in which we must drift the great genius Kant, according to Bernhard, in the same state of helplessness as all the others. Thomas Bernhardt was a writer who took the dark view. The shrinking of Kant's mind, the breadth of his interests and wisdom down to his little East Prussian head does seem like a loss. But maybe too, it's like the freeze dried vegetables in packet soup, merely awaiting water for reconstitution. In contradiction of Bernhardt's darkness, I'll offer a quotation from a 1980s British film, The Long Good Friday, in which gangster Harold Shand, brilliantly played by the late Bob Hoskins, gives a speech at a party on his yacht in the Thames, welcoming the American mafia to London to collaborate on some white collar crime in the East End. 
Hands across the ocean, he says in his Cockney growl, bullish and optimistic. Hands across the ocean. Because of course, Bernhardt is absolutely right. Of so much of our lives, we retain but a so-called hue, philosophical or not. But to convey what Bernhard laments as a single successful sentence, that I firmly believe is cause for celebration. Even a single successful sentence can be transformative and a single poem or novel can alter someone's life forever. That is hands across the ocean. And it's a meeting that happens if not only then most fully through language. With words, we can travel across nations and through time, we can inhabit lives far from us. Beautiful. Now, worlds, traveling worlds, lives far from our own. Um, in the book, you talk a lot about your father's sense of statelessness. You know, he was born in Algeria, and then along came the Algerian War. And I, I think he went, if your grandfather was in the Navy, the French Navy. He had been lifted up by the French system uh, out of poverty into a solid position. And uh, so he, he traveled to, I think it was Beirut, and then Istanbul, and then Beirut, and then Rabat, I don't quite remember. Um, but uh, one of the most moving uh, parts of the book, and there are many moving parts, is when your father was actually dying uh, in 2010, 10 year, 11 years ago, I, I think. And you were at visiting him at his nursing, at the nursing home, and you were going to go to Beirut, and he drew a map of the neighborhood he'd lived as an eight-year-old. Uh, could you tell, tell, tell them about that map and what it made you think and what you did with it in Beirut? Um, so, yes, so, so my father, um, so my grandfather was in the Navy and my father um, was born in 31 and uh, my aunt in 33. And in 36, my grandfather was posted, he was the naval attache in Beirut. And then he was moved to Salonika and then back to Beirut. Um, and then there was travels and he, anyway, but um, then there was the war. So, um, and they ended up back in Algeria. But, but, um, but so my father's happiest childhood memories were of, of their family life in Beirut before the war. And he was, he, he had been, um, I know now having read the 1500 pages by my grandfather, he was very, my father was really unhappy when they went to Algiers and he was lonely and he missed his friends and, you know, the war was on and he, he, he just kept saying, can we go back to Beirut, which of course they could not. But, um, but so I had the opportunity, my father had been um, quite ill in 2008 and, and then was ill again in 2010 and 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 I was offered the opportunity to go teach in Beirut and I went and he um and he and I thought I had this idea that I was that somehow I would be able to bring back something for him that would be meaningful um or have some experience that was meaningful and I went looking for his childhood home um you know but but that's a whole other story but but he he so he drew me this map um and 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 what was amazing about it was how accurate it was! He drew the coastline and and um, the, the, the these famous rocks right off the off the shore. He drew the rocks. He drew the the university where the university was. He drew and then he drew Ashrafie, which was the neighborhood that he was from, and and the you know the 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 is it called the Place du Gouvernement downtown? And I mean he drew all these things, and and then he put also this is where Tanyos the the market is and this is where you know so you put on the map all these things that he hadn't seen in 70 years or and that and that no longer exists so there were all the things that still exist but but there were also the things that don't exist right so mm -hmm. so w when we live in a city over time the palimpsest we be, we're unaware of it because it it you know and sometimes we might pause and say oh that's where that italian restaurant used to be that's now the mexican or whatever but 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 for him, it was it was as if there was this frozen city that he had that he knew so well, and of course, especially poor Beirut that has suffered so much, uh, you know, and and had so much violence and destruction in the course of their long civil war. The city, the city that was there in 1939 is 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 lives in nobody's memory now you know so because, because anybody who stayed there has been i mean is barely alive at this point but also has been through so much so so um yeah so i think you know for me for me that that 
not unlike my my grandfather writing his his memoirs for my sister and me, and not unlike reading Ivan Illich uh, writing about uh, childhood on a on a rural estate uh, in Russia. You know, I mean, I I just think that 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 um, that the the specificity and vividness um, that 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 we have within us and uh you know for, for realities that there's the i quote somewhere the salman rushdie imaginary homelands essay where he says you know that 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 this as soon as you as soon as the past is another country and as soon as you move anywhere but also as soon as you move through time you know you're carrying lost worlds inside you and um and and i do feel that that literature is 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 a way um is a way to communicate something something of that and uh, because your father seems to have, you, you said that he exhaustively uh, collected articles of news of the Middle East, but left out completely. Uh, was it was it uh, was it Algeria? He didn't collect information on. Okay. Well, this, right. So these, but this was from when he was doing his PhD. So he started a PhD in Middle Eastern studies. Right. Um, and 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 it was after he died. I was clearing out the the boxes of the unfinished. PhD notes. The PhD was about political parties in Turkey, mm -hmm. um, but um, but he had files on on all of the sort of uh, you know from the from the late fifties on all of the uh, liberation movements and pan Arabism and so on um, in in you know everywhere everywhere not just I mean Morocco yes uh, Tunisia yes uh, uh, you know. Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Pakistan, so on, so on. He he had these files for everybody, and no file for Algeria, none. It, it just it seems like an important omission, and I I, I just it, it's so amazing, you know, the the history that touched his life, which he did not write about, even if he could draw a map of the delineations of the neighborhood. So exactly, I wonder, do you feel? like an American? Do you feel like a part Australian, a part French? I mean, do you feel stateless or how do you, how identified do you feel with a country? So yeah, that's a, that's a, um, a question of interest, probably only to me. Ah, uh, <laughs> okay. Over the course of my life, I've, I sort of fuss about it a, a, a good deal. Um, and I have sort of various answers. And, and one thing I would say is that when, when Obama was elected president in 2008. That was the first time I thought there's somebody like me, right? There's somebody who who is this strange mix of things that you wouldn't necessarily put together, you know, mm -hmm. um, his father from Kenya, his upbringing in, in Hawaii, but also Indonesia, you know, I mean, this, that the, the, this, the, this, um, this hybridity was officially American, right? And that was for me at least really important um symbolically you know to there were lots of ways in which obama um is you know an important figure um symbolically but that was one for me is the, is 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 that hybridity um is is not something you know um and 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 i would say you know in recent years you know one of the things i i feel that people are tribal and there's a desire to return to tribal thinking um and I have no tribe, right? I, that's the issue. It's it, hybridity is the place. The, the hybrid people. That's where I belong. I belong with the people who who the have tribe is readers, maybe, maybe, maybe. Uh, but so, I, so I, if I, America can be that, then I'm American. But sometimes it feels like America can't be that. So um, you 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 spent every childhood. Um, in visiting Toulon, which is where your parent, your father's parents, who were very devoted Catholics, very in love with each other, lived with your difficult aunt, uh, who you, I think her name is Denise, but they were such a unit. And I know you're going to, I'm going to ask you to read something from that. So I'll try and, did you, I don't know if Pamont is in the section you're reading. Um, I actually don't know either. I think I was going to read a little bit later. Okay, so. good. But so they were such a tight threesome and she was a lawyer, but she also wanted to have been a nun practically. She was so devoted to, uh, what was he called, Père Casanova? But um, she was very uh, devoted to your grandfather and grandmother, but also to your father. But your father kind of took care of her 
and your mother. And I was just interested in the opposition of you write. There's a there's a book about. I'm sorry. There's a chapter of your book about these two women, which of course makes me think of Jane Bowles, Two Serious Ladies, which you which is one of your later chapters. But your your grandmother. Your I'm sorry. Your mother, uh, Margaret Riches, who she met your father at Oxford Summer School, and one of her co-students was Gloria Steinem. That must have been some summer class. Um, <laughs> but your your mother. Well, your mother had wanted to be a lawyer herself, is that right? Whereas yes. your aunt had wanted to have children, thought that was yes. her calling. And, you know, it must have given you such a complicated idea of what a woman should do to find happiness. You, you, you give an oracular statement that your mother made that just, um, uh, that just killed me, where she said there's still so much yes. of life to get through once you realize that your dreams won't come true. Like she acted like she was oppressed, but didn't leave the home. Whereas your grand, your aunt would have liked to have children. How do you think? You know, you saw yourself as a writer, but did you? How did your mother and aunt's roles or model make you think about what it would be to, for you to be a woman and what you wanted? If you, I, I mean, I, I, th I think that um, look, I, I I think it's hard sometimes to convey to uh, people of our you know, the next generation, my children's age, young people who are around 20 now, I think it's hard to convey uh, the, the constraint, the limitations that people felt in our, our parents' generation, right? I mean, already by the time we were young, there, there was, you know, maybe it was a myth, but you can do everything, you can have everything, you can do it all. It was a myth, you know, but, but, but it, that was, that was sort of the, the, line with which we, you know, I always feel about my mother in particular, that she was someone who was of a, uh, it's interesting, there was, there's a, um, oh, my, my mind, um, Maggie, there was a, a book came out just about the Radcliffe, first Radcliffe uh, Fellows, the Bunting Institute. Um, does this ring a bell with, with um, Maxine Cumin and it came out about a year ago, but it's, anyways, it's about Sylvia Plath and, and, um, and Sexton, just about a particular generation, which I think was, you know, my mother's generation, um, where they changed the rules halfway, right? Where, where when you were, you, you were so, so if you were born in the 30s, you were in college in the 50s. It was, it was presumed that you, as a woman, that you know, you would marry and um, you would be a housewife and have kids, and you know, you would, you would do a certain thing and you would support your husband, and um, and then all of a sudden, you know, they weren't. They weren't that old when sort of the equivalents. Thank you. Yes, the equivalents. Um, they weren't that old when when suddenly feminism came roaring into view. Um, but but they also had children, you know, and they had and and they were settled in a different way than people who were twenty five. You know, I, at one point I, I I wrote a little piece. It was for Virago's fortieth birthday. I think. Oh, love my Virago. Mother, mm -hmm. My mother was forty when Virago was founded, right? And that was the, the dawn of the 70s. It was a really important moment. And my mother had all, she bought all the Virago books, you know, she ordered them and kept, but, but 40 is, you have to have a certain, um, you, you have to have a certain confidence and a certain um, temperament and a certain whatever to, to, to say at 40, I'm, I'm changing my life entirely, right? And my mother didn't have that temperament. And so she was somebody who it was as if she, you know, the, the feminist boat sailed and she stood on the shore and pined. Oh, oh it's, it's, it's tragic. And one of the things you write about that moved me very deeply was uh, she, she developed Parkinson's and then the Louis body uh, syndrome that can go along with that. You know, our generation maybe doesn't have what those women had, but our generation is, is dealing with all kinds of issues with with our parents and i really you know you are a literary woman this is a literary novel and it's a, well i'm sorry a literary book and also a memoir but i i think many people will find very apt and living lessons for for what a lot of people are reckoning with right now in it um the one section i i, I one section of the book that i haven't mentioned yet is you have three different looks at camus the stranger which is really interesting because it resonates with your father's and grandfather's lives so strongly. Um, but in it, you quote Camus, uh, something because Camus, you explain, really uh, 
loved Algeria and missed it and couldn't bear being uh, re ejected from it, but also couldn't imagine it is not French. And it, it's very fascinating, the section you write on that. But you, you quote um, a, something that Camus wrote about Algeria, which may or may not have been, I'm sure it would have struck a note with your father, but he said, every artist keeps within himself a single source, which, which he nourishes during, I'm sorry, which nourishes during his lifetime, what he is and what he says. When that spring runs dry, little by little, one sees his work shrivel and crack. My source is in the world of poverty and sunlight I lived in for so long. Algeria, you know, that's the, that, he doesn't say Algeria, I just said Algeria. And I wondered what, what you might say your source was. You have written so much, but not too much. You're, you're not, you know, it's not a book a year. Uh, but do you have a, a, what would your source be? Would it be place or people or memory? Or what, what would you think your source is? You know, I think there are places that are very, um... There are there are places that are, are very evocative to me in 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 different times. So I would probably say I had several. You know, one of the things about having the funny peripatetic life that I that I had as a kid, um, I, I I recently said to my husband, I said I think it's been it was a useful training for the pandemic, because you know it, when you move as people who move a lot, you like you, you're a kid, like your friends you don't get to see, you like your friends vanish overnight. You you know the all the places you know vanish overnight. You you're starting again. I feel like you 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 know you're you're ready for the moment when you can no longer go into Harvard Square and 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 eat a meal with people because you know when you're a kid that would just happen one day. Um, anyway. But um, but I but I think another thing of having have, of having had these different um, homes, if you will, is that there there are places that are very uh, there are places that are very evocative to me in in different ways. They you know uh, um, and 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 I feel in that in that sense of you know what I was in reading about you know the days, the minutes, the you know the minutes, the days, the uh, weeks and months of his life. Um, there's so much. Uh, material that I that I feel it um you it sounds like you have many sources and uh so we can expect you to be drawing the water from them well I was, I was gonna say I have many sources and and perhaps at this point not so much life so <laughs> so probably enough source to last the rest of my life um in, in the book you say that uh you, you talk about the pandemic pause uh but you also talk about the value of reading uh, as opposed to watching a movie or uh, a video, or I forget the other example, could you explain what you feel that the the singular gift of reading is um, as a uh, as an as imaginative play or as whatever you see it? I mean, I, it's, there's not a singular gift. There are a thousand gifts. I mean, I you know I think I think there there are many um, there are many many. Uh, elements you know uh, the 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 play of language the 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 deployment of words the 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 layers of of nuance and and ambiguity the way that that a, that a a sentence can be both um precise and lucid and yet have sort of room for connotation and 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 his, you know some sort of, sort of atmosphere um there are all sorts of I can go on at length about all the amazing things about you know why we why we work with words, um, but 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 I also I feel that there is um, there is just this experience that is so intimate when you read a book, it's your book you know you feel as though um, it's the thing that now Nabok you inhabit it do you mean yeah well when Nab as you create it actually right because. Because, oh, no, no, climbing the mountain mm -hmm. yes climbing the mountain from both sides but 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 even just things like um when i say family i say the word family and all of this stuff is is behind the word family for me you say the word family and there's a whole other i mean presumably they're overlapping but they might be quite different so when you read the you know all happy families are alike right when you read that sentence that that has one meaning for you and a slightly different meaning for me and and there's the amazing thing is that there's enough agreement that 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 we're reading the same book, but each of us has our own version. And when we imagine it, we imagine the way people look and how they move and and what they're wearing and what it all sounds like. And um, you know, and 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 when you see a film, somebody's imagined that for you. But 
Um, and that's a fine thing too, but it isn't the same as having it be entirely yours, right? You transpose it onto yourself. Mm -hmm. Made up of the words that you that you have interacted with and have a relationship with. It's active in a different way. Um, you, you talk a little about translation uh, in the book. I think it's mostly in the in the bowl section. I'm sorry, in the Camus section. But you talk, you say um, there's this central, centrally important belief that you discard at your peril in translation itself, uh, that communication between widely disparate languages and cultures is possible and to be encouraged. And I wondered what you thought of the idea that a novel is a kind of translation of experience. Um, well, and I mean, here's, this is, so, so again, everything is, I know, everything is, it's conventions and culturally specific and da da da, but yes, that's entirely, for me, I feel like, what do, what am I seeking in a novel? What is the experience that to me is meaningful in a novel? It, it is some, some rendition of what it's like to be a human alive on the planet, right? That's, that for me is, is, I think in the broadest terms. And one of the things, you know, there are lots of people who don't believe that. There are lots of people who, who who don't believe who believe that it's about entertainment or plot or any of a number of things that people don't need to behave the way a person would really behave for me a fiction is only interesting when people behave the way not every person or not even the majority of people but the way a person would behave that's that's it's that's it's interesting at this cultural moment where we've seen so much uh obnoxious and inhuman behavior we have at the same time an incredibly idealistic generation of millennials and the group after them um many of I, I, who are my students in part <laughs> and uh and i've noticed a resistance to the idea that a novel can be fictional and you write about rachel cusk in one of your writer chapters and she says that she really thinks autobiography is the way of the future. I mean, could you speak to this tension that people are maybe having who are younger than us with the idea of not writing in your own voice, but writing conjuring fictional worlds that maybe aren't yours um, and, and, and the ascendance of autobiography, if you think it is an ascendance? Um, so I think that the, the ascendance of autobiography as, as a, a subject of interest for readers, right, is a different conversation or they're related but but certainly there has been an ascendance of the memoir in the past 25 years maybe longer um you know and there are lots of reasons um for that i think um but lots of different reasons but 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 this the separate issue of people feeling less able to write fiction um i, I worry comes from a sort of prescriptive and totalitarian view um, that abroad in the land that is to be resisted, um, which is basically utilitarian and anti-imagination, as though you cannot imagine anything that you did not experience. And, um, and, and we actually just know that not to be the case. I mean, I think of the, um, you know, I, uh, the wonderful Eudora Welty uh, story, the name of which in a in a senior moment way is is eluding me, but which she wrote in the in the wake of the murder of Medgar Evers, and um, and she imagined the killer, and she said, I I I knew I did not know who the exact man was, but I knew exactly what he would look like and what his motivations would be, and and she was entirely right. Um, you know, it, Flaubert, Flaubert said of Madame Bovary, there, you know, there are, he, not only did he say Madame Bovary, c'est moi, he said there are, you know, a hundred meta or a thousand Madame Bovaries around me in France today. It, it, if you imagine, if you listen and observe carefully and imagine with humility and precision, right, th then, then yes, obviously there are limits. Everybody's going to have limits, but the idea that the limit is, is, the reach of your own body or uh, or experience seems to me seems to me simply untrue and and really problematic for the freedom of of art and the freedom of young people wonderful and i i wonder I, did you want to finish that in a book of thought that we alluded to about the mountain it's in the book i'm sure you remember it Oh, it was just that, that, that the, the experience of literature is the writer and the reader climbing the mountain from opposite sides to meet at the top. And, and I think, you know, that, that, um, 
that is what's so special, right? That that that's what's so precious about um, uh, 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 about reading is this activity, right? I, it, just a little plug also for the old handwriting. I saw I saw some something um, saying. Lo and behold, surprise, surprise, test show, you know, neurological studies show that, that, that we learn things better when we write them down than if we, you know, or read them on paper than if, if, it's, if it's on a screen. Well, I feel like, well, it's no, we are animals. We are embodied. We live in our bodies. If we do something with our bodies, it makes an impression on us. If we don't do it with our bodies, it makes much less impression. So, uh, you know, I feel that the, 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 the reading is, is a thing paradoxically that you do with your body. Your brain is part of your body. You imagine something as opposed to having something fed to you. You imagine it. The interior life absorbed by your physical body in reading. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's really exciting. Now, I, I don't know if we have time to get to questions. Um, I wanted you to read a section from your chapter on the two women. Um, if I don't see a comment, yeah, could you read that section? And uh, we can. And Nadine will tell us if there are a reader question, or listener questions that we need to interrupt with. But okay. I, I'd love. To, this is about uh, the two women in your fathers and your lives. So I thought I would. I I would read actually just um, perhaps confusingly from the end of the of the um, of this essay, which is about my mother and my aunt. My father had one sister, Denise, who never married, and my and my mother was an only child. So they were the two women of my youth. Um, both women formed me, even as they shaped my father's life. Albeit differently, they taught my sister and me that we should what, that we should ask for and expect less, even as they encouraged us to strive for more. Lessons that seem quaintly old-fashioned now. In the parking lot of the nursing home where Father Bob delivered the last rites to my father, my mother mildly demented remarked with sadness in her voice, but also with considerable calm. There's still so much of life to get through once you realize that your dreams won't come true. She'd never taken up much space, but in those last years, she took up less and less, ever polite, obliterated, but gracious to her 10 month bedridden end. Tante Denise, meanwhile, erased herself little by little in a different, uglier way with the help of La Belle Cinq, a cheap whiskey. She called the Atlantic that accursed ocean, but managed nevertheless to cross it to be with her brother when he was dying. She largely ignored her sister-in-law at that point and picked fights instead with my sister. Once Francois Michel, my father, was gone, Denise saw no reason to hold on and her alcoholic suicide began in, in earnest. Skip, um, no, I'll leave that. My father had all his life two women to take care of, four if you count my sister and me. He was devoted to his sister and he adored his wife, though they irked him each in her way. He who had no time for gossip said nothing behind their backs. In fact, I never heard him criticize my aunt at all, though he and my mother quarreled a great deal over the years. <laughs> he knew what she was supposed to be, married, a mother, sweet, submissive, approved wholeheartedly, even judgmentally of those traditional ideals, but couldn't for the life of her fulfill them. We've often wondered whether her unrequited heterosexual loves were for show and whether in our era or without the pressures of her Catholic faith, her intimate life might have unfolded differently. Margaret, in contrast, despised what she was supposed to be, married, a mother, sweet, submissive, and yet was most successfully all of these things. What she wanted instead, she was too submissive to attain. From the two of them, I learned that to hope for happiness, or peace even, I should strive to be everything, but also that I was probably doomed. There's still so much of life to get through when you realize that your dreams won't come true. Painfully, both my mother's and my aunt's identities involved profound self-loathing. They believed, as so many women have been brought up to believe, that they were inadequate as they were. I have struggled with uncertain success to divest myself of that legacy. Yet much that I internalized from these two women, I still uphold. The joy and dignity of small pleasures, the gift of requiring less in order to find contentment, the Christian ethics that teach us to put others before ourselves, to be humble, to be kind. Curiosity, openness, fearlessness, generosity of spirit, above all, love, these things I also learned from them to live with an open heart and an open mind and to live with kindness, truisms perhaps, but not, the less ad, not less admirable goals for that. If there's an afterlife, I don't believe access to it lies in the hands of Father Bob with his hanky wrapped host, nor do I believe there's particular merit in my mother's urge to banish potentially assuaging rituals of faith. If I'd only found the priest between Stanford and White Plains who could deliver the last rites in French, my father might have been consoled, even without believing he might have been consoled. 
Beautiful. Um, and uh, Nadine, do we have some questions? We do indeed. We have quite a few, so we can't unfortunately get to all of them, but we will try to answer a few. Um, a question from uh, Ellen. Uh, she is saying, how wonderful that you were raised by two readers and knew you wanted to be a writer by the age of six. But where did the confidence come from to pursue this challenging art? Ah, confidence. That's a good question. I, I, I think, um, I think, you know, I, I, you, when you when you ask that question, I have the memory of my father who worried about our futures and who was, in spite of everything, traditional. But he 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 was he he did he believed we could do anything in a way. And yet, and I remember when I was um, I said I was a teenager and I said I want to be a writer when I grow up. And he said, Oh, Claire, Claire, but only geniuses can be writers. And frankly, Claire, Claire. <laughs> So, but somewhere they gave me the confidence, right? Somewhere, somewhere, um, somewhere they, they had, I, he was very glad when I married, even though I married a literary critic, he felt that it was the literary critic's job to keep me, um, to, to, to keep me alive. So then I could be a writer if I wanted. Um, anyway, <laughs> that was the, that's, I feel like that's hard to explain, but that was my father's attitude in life. It's hard to explain to my kids. Yeah. Um, but 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 basically, you know, I think they did they did say you certainly they said, which I always try with my students to convey. Um, we're incredibly lucky to have the English language, right? We have we have the language Shakespeare used three times as many or is it five times many many more words than Racine used in French. He he, you know, the English language is this a vast elastic. And, and and it is a it is a power that belongs to each of us, right? There's no there's that's not about money, that's not about business. The language is ours. And 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 you can read and you can write and you can say things. And I think they conveyed that to me. I think they did. They they, they conveyed to me that the language was mine. I that's great, that's wonderful. Uh, question from Helen, uh, Helen says, thank you, Claire and Liesl for a very illuminating session. Uh, Claire, can you speak to writing fiction versus nonfiction, how it affects you, the particular challenge and joy of writing one versus the other? Hi, Helen, um, that's a great question. I don't know if I um, can properly articulate, I, I, I feel about nonfiction a, a, res, a particular set of responsibilities, um, a sort of, you know, I, I, I'm always a little confused by creative nonfiction because I am the person who, like, I'm like the kid in class who cannot tell a lie, you know? I'm like, I can't, but how could you tell? Me? Like, so I feel that nonfiction has a particular set of responsibilities and, and, and fiction curiously does have, um, a set of responsibilities too, right? So, so, so when I said earlier that that what I'm interested in fiction is how people live on the planet, who you know, individual pieces of life on the planet, I feel like I can't, I, I can't, I have to be trying to follow uh, something that seems traject a trajectory or a movement that seems true to me. I can't, so I can't just make up any old thing like, and then she, you know. Flew away. I can't. I can't. I can't um, do that. So, um, so I. So so in that sense, I, it it does have responsibilities too. But it is freer. You are freer. On the other hand, with nonfiction, you're. Um, you know that 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 sieve from the, the sea. You're carrying. You're carrying something back up the beach. You have the material. <laughs> One question from another viewer. Do you feel you'd be using the pandemic as the setting for a piece of fiction? Hmm. That's a really good question. I don't know. Camus did it so well already. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm very curious actually about what will happen, whether, you know, historically pandemics have sort of been unlike wars, 
have been sort of forgotten, right? Kind of suppressed and forgotten. Once people, it's like having a cold, you get better and you forget that you had a cold. And I feel like pandemics is historically people have, have sort of squelched the memory of them. And I don't, I'm, I'll be, it'll, inshallah, we live long enough, it'll be interesting to know. Mm -hmm. True. Um, uh, we have time for one final question and then I'll turn it back to you um, to close it out um, from Audrey. What do you think the future of the novel is with all the increasing reliance on digital media? So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there are lots of different narrative forms and I know that lots of, of young people, you know, um, explore narrative form as it were on, on, uh, on digital media, right? So, so I, I believe I don't, play video games, but I think they're a narrative form, right? I mean, I think, you know, of a kind. So, so I, I, I have no fear about narrative, right? Falling away. I, th I think there, there are, um, uh, what I would say is, you know, the novel is a relatively new form, right? Um, compared to poetry and drama. Um, but look, poetry and drama are still here. And, um, and, and poetry, you know, poetry survives through thick and thin. And I think that, I think the novel will survive. It, it may not be something that survives. We may have passed a heyday of, of popular novel reading, but maybe not, you know, I think we just don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to wait and we'll just have to wait and see. That's the thing with a novel, you get to the end with life until you die, you don't get to the end. So you don't know. <laughs> Um, so I lied. There's one. I, I want to ask one more question because I think it's a good one um, from D. Uh, why did you choose the writers you did to use in this book? So um, D, thank you for that question. Um, so that's that. I think is referring to probably the, the literary pieces um, that there are some there are a few pieces about artists at the end too, but it's mostly their personal pieces and then these literary pieces. And I've written over the course of now a number of years a lot more pieces than are included in the book but I chose um, I chose ones that that I chose pieces um, that e were either the, the the particular book or the writer um, and the writers are, ha have been important to me um, and and it might in, 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 it have been the book is important because of its subject matter or because of its um, or, or because of its uh, form you know I, I found um, the the uh, Chronicle of a Last Summer, which is this novel about Egypt um, by Yasmin al Rashidi, um, that for me was formally so interesting. It was like I, I I had the experience of reading it, knowing nothing about Egypt, and then and then thinking I should find out a little more about about recent Egyptian history. And then I reread it, and it was as if a, a a sort of trap door had opened, and I and I had a, a whole new world of experience because every detail was telling. It's just that when I first read it, I didn't know enough to read the details as, as they, in their fullness, right? So that for me was formally really interesting. Um, so yeah, so, so um, each writer was chosen for some particular personal reason, um, a book that changed my life or uh, changed the way I write or changed the way I think about writing. And if I could just ask one question, you begin and end the book or pretty much with Valeria Luiselli and her book, Archive of Lost Children. And um, maybe you could just as a final thing, just explain to us how you that what chord that struck with you uh, in our time and why that yeah. book is interesting as a document that involves digital as well as other forms of technology. It, you know, I think I so so there's there's a quotation um, that I have at the beginning in the introduction that is from Lost Children Archive, um, where where the character writes um, something changed in the world not too long ago it changed we feel time differently, perhaps it's just that we sense an absence of future because the present has become too overwhelming so the future has become unimaginable, and um, and 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 um, and I think you know the 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 her novel, Lost Children Archive, which, which is um, almost insanely ambitious, right? It, it, it's ambitious formally, it's ambitious 
structurally it's, they were, or it diminishes characterologically, you know, in terms of its narrative voices. One is a, a small boy telling, you know, one is a, an older woman, a, a mother um, telling a narrative, but the second is a sort of fairy tale. There, there, there are these boxes uh, full of documents. There's a fictional novel within the novel. I mean, it has all sorts of things going on. Um, and and some of you know I, I think it's an extraordinary book. I I feel as though you know if you sat me down and said I have questions about this bit or I wondered about that bit, but um but 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 what I so admire is is that she is tackling with all engines as it were um, these fundamental questions about what can the novel do now, what relevance does the novel have today. How is the novel different from nonfiction? How is the novel different from essays? Um, what space does it afford for possibility, imagination, for revelation? Um, what are its responsibilities and duties to the world? What are the limitations of what can be done? You know, that, that certainly that first person, the first half of the novel, which is in the first um, person, that narrator um, who seems very close to Louise Zelli herself in the essays that she wrote about. Um, about tackling the border uh, crisis, um, which she worked for an NGO translating, um, and 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 that narrator seems very close, and I thought, and and articulates very specifically the limitations of 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 the of, of responsibility um, to fact, right? But how do you fictionalize things? How do you invent things or or put things in other people's voices? And then the second part, which is a sort of fairy tale from, you know, almost a fairy tale from, from a little boy's point of view about him and his sister to heading off into the desert, right? That, that's, that, that is, that is sort of the, the, there's scary stuff in there, but it's the beauty of the imagination and the freedom of the imagination in a totally different way. So I feel as though the book as a whole is, is, is she's, she's putting all of her attention and all of her effort to to asking really big questions about 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 not about not just about the world because it's about the world today, but about what the role of the novel is and what the novel can do. It sounds like as long as the imagination perseveres, the novel the novel perseveres. You know. There's hope. There's hope. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, and. Um, and I just I encourage everyone to read this wonderful book. You don't have to put all the post-its in it that I did, uh, but I think uh, you will find so much that's valuable and thought-provoking. And I'm hoping that it'll inspire some of you to write, to record these memories that you hold in you like a reservoir, to bring your own sieve or your pen and paper to it. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave my host to uh, finish us off. I, I just oh. wanted to dip in and say thank you to, if I may, thank you, Liesl, thank you so much, and Nadine, thank you. This has just been such a gift and a treat for me, so thank you. Oh my God, and, and thank you both. What a fascinating conversation, um, and thank you to um, everybody who joined us. Thank you to our literary committee for making this possible. Um, it was truly an honor and a privilege to listen to both of you, um, and yeah. Thank you and please be well everyone out there and I hope to see you soon in person at the National Arts Club. Um, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, have a good night everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.